Did you guys see the video that Ken Dotson put on the Facebook page? Yeah, I loved it. That's great. When did Are we opening one? Yeah, so probably next week. Or we're, we're going to try to put it on Facebook this week. Actually, that's awesome what Ken Dotson did. He used his, his airplane thing and took photos of the church and did, like, zoomed in on the cross and zoomed in on the sign. For fun. For fun. I know. seconds. Hey there. Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Church. 
Oh, it's great to be in worship with all of you, no matter where you are sitting this morning. Time to carve out some time to be in God's presence as we gather, not only in the church and around the church and in the community, but even possibilities around the whole world. My name is Cherie Cobb, and I'm the pastor here at Mountain Vista United Methodist Church, and I am grateful and glad that you are in worship with us this morning. We are a Christ-centered community drawn together by the Holy Spirit to experience and to express and to expand God's love through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So in your homes, will you prepare your own hearts for worship this morning and be in an attitude of prayer as I open this up with the morning prayer. Sweet, gracious God, there are so many times when our hearts turn away from you, when we become angry or judgmental, when we speak falsehoods, when we squander your blessings, and when we covet the things that are not ours. Gracious God, forgive us. God, help us to speak words of encouragement and love to one another. God, give us the strength and the energy to follow in your ways that we may be your faithful followers of Jesus Christ, and it is in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So in your homes, let's stand and let's sing this hymn, and in the meantime, also get your Bibles. Good morning. Just a few announcements for you, church. Um, we will have worship up at Rockport State Park. Do 
you know which day? Here's the information. August 16th, RSVPs are required. We will have baptisms. Bring your own bucket of chicken. Bring your own chair. Bring your own sunblock. Wear your masks. Wear your hats. Wear whatever you need to and come and worship in the open space. So it's close to Park City, also close to Heber. Um, you can find the directions from the website. The park fee is $10 unless you already have your state pass. And you need to call your pastor to reserve your spot. I have a few more spots for those who get to me first. And then on August 23rd, we have Ashton who will be giving us a, his testimony of how God's worked in his life. And then on August 30th, in reference to worship, we will then be opening up the sanctuary with a minimum of 50 people. And again, you'll have to call Pastor Cherie, that's me, to RSVP. A couple of different ways for you to stay connected in the different ways that God calls you and the different ways that your heart is needing. We have coffee hour via Zoom on Fridays at 8 a.m. Chuck has the information and the links on the website. We have a Saturday connection group and a Tuesday connection circle. Both are just opportunities to take your chairs and to go and to be with other people in a safe distance. The Saturday connection group is close to Cheryl Brown's house in the Constitution Park. And then the Tuesday connection group is in the West Jordan Memorial Park. And so just come and be and enjoy the company of your brothers and sisters. A couple other ways that you may be wanting to get connected is through Bible studies. And so we have three groups that are starting this next week. A men's group in Colossians, a women's group in Colossians. The women's group is both on Zoom Tuesday mornings or Thursday evenings. Give me a, um, just text me if you want to be um, included in either one of these studies. The men's study is at the pastor's home from 6 to 8 for men, but it's also, we have capabilities for Zoom as well. So again, those links to those Bible studies are on our website, but you first need to let me know if you are interested so I can send you some information. The other announcements that we had this morning, it's just a reminder that many of us are using on the YouVersion app on our phone, we're using the Bible Recap as one of the reading plans. And Jane and I have already gone through like two books, or actually maybe four books of the Bible so far. I'm in numbers, and so it's not that exciting. But part of this is the YouVersion Bible app, and then the next slide that you will see, then you can toggle over to whatever podcast, if you use Podbean or whatever it is, and then you can listen to a five-minute recap of what you just read. And it's a great way to help us understand what we are reading and to help us retain some of that. And then lastly, I just want to remind you that we are continuing to pray for a new ministry here at, at our church at Mountain Vista called Celebrate Recovery. Um, some of the topics that we'll be talking about today, um, Celebrate Recovery, are places for those who truly celebrate their recovery. And so I am grateful to have this opportunity just to share some of these announcements with you. Please, everybody feel free to contact me in any way, text, email, or phone calls. Um, Ray Dale will be back in the office on Monday from a, a vacation. And so thank you, Whitney, for um, keeping the church open and man maintaining some of those office hours. And so let's go ahead and prepare our hearts for worship with the, the opening with the scripture this morning. Good morning, church. Our readings today will be from Galatians and Matthew, and first from Galatians 5. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. And from Matthew 5, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, 
cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The good and beautiful life. As we prepare our hearts for this message this morning, Holy Spirit, I, I ask that you stir within our hearts. Holy Spirit, stir our sense of wonder and curiosity that your holy word may speak to us, will come alive for us in new and wondrous ways. God, open our ears. God, open our hearts to your word of life this very day, this very moment. And the people of God said, amen, amen. So the good and beautiful life and putting on the character of Jesus Christ. So we continue in our sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. And last week, we talked about the good and beautiful life and how do we learn to live without anger. And guess what? I'm sure you're all glad you came to church today because today we get to talk about the good and beautiful life and how do we learn to live without lust. And so that's where we are in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, and we're focusing in on verses 27 through 30. And so we get to talk about lust. And I just, I don't think I've ever given anybody a warning before I dive into the message, but here it is. Parents, grandparents, children, if you were all in the house with your parents watching this message, stay put. Stay put. But parents and grandparents, if you have your children with you, be open for them to have more conversations with you. Because I'm going to say words like sexual desire. I'm going to say words like lust. I'm going to say words like um, leering. I'm going to talk about a, a, a Greek word, epithumia, and talk about what that means, about object, objectifying other people for our own gratification. So this is my warning. And that's why we open up sometimes with extra prayers. But this is something so important for us. I told Whitney what I was going to be preaching on, and you know what she said? She's our youth director, and she says, Oh, pastor, maybe it's a good thing that the church is empty when you're talking about lust. Well, Whitney... Tune in, and everybody else, tune in. Contemporary society is obsessed with sexuality and lust. And you know what? We don't even realize it anymore. Contemporary society is obsessed with sexuality and lust. Our magazines drip with it. Our TV programs are obsessed with it and the movies and even many of the musical songs and videos. You know, have you thought about when I was younger, we listened to records or the radio, but today the kids just don't listen with their ears. They are watching music videos and there's a lot more going on in those music videos from when I was a kid. And so even the TV programs, the movies are all obsessed with sexuality and lust. The songs that we watch and hear are all under Underneath this veneer of love, folks, we are a society that is fascinated with sexuality. People live for sex, they kill for sex, and they die because of sex. Now, 2009, there was a study that said over 14,000 sexual references are made on TV per year. That's an 11-year-old statistic. What do you think How many sexual references do we see in a regular old year just from regular old TV? I would guess that it is higher than 14,000 sexual references. You know, an actress on a popular crime drama was asked um, why her character wore such a low-cut and revealing outfit. Because you guys know forensic experts usually wear those smocks. And so this is how the actress responded. She said... The more cleavage, the higher the ratings. Folks, we have become so desensitized to sexual imagery that advertisers know 
They must use provocative images just to get our attention. Just to get our attention. And so we're going to talk about two dominant narratives in our world that are false. And one comes from the church, and the other one comes from the culture. And you know what? Both are false, and both lead to frustration and failure. Dallas Willard says this, and you'll see it on the screen. The two main errors in the area of human sexuality are, number one, believing that all sexual desire, desire is evil. Number two, assuming that all sexual desire is good. And so these are the dominant narratives of our culture and our world today. And this first narrative says that sexual desire is inherently sinful. This is kind of the dominant narrative of the Christian or the church. It has been the dominant narrative in Christian circles from the beginning of church history. There are many early Christian writers to whom we can trace this belief but perhaps the most famous and the most brilliant and influential was St. Augustine. You can see on the screen, he wrote a very famous book called Confessions. It's actually in my office. I meant to go get it so I could show you, but it's here on the screen. Augustine was a philosopher. He was a theologian. He was a prolific writer. And he was also the Bishop of Hippo, which today would be the area of Annabel Algeria. Augustine was writing in the 4th and 5th centuries, and he was of the opinion that sexual desire was sinful, period. Augustine wrestled with lust throughout his life, which is very clear when you read his writings from that book, The Confessions. Augustine prayed. He said, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. Have you ever done that? Lord, help me with this thing that I struggle with, but, but not yet. Wait till after the barbecue so I can eat what I want to eat. I mean, I am guilty of sort of kind of praying like that. Like, and so here we have from the 4th and 5th century, one of the very big influencers of the Christian early church. You can tell with that clear indication of his own inner conflict. And if we are honest with ourselves, we also have an inner conflict. Augustine, he eventually adopted the narrative that sexual desire is bad, and he thought complete celibacy is good. And really, where would that have gotten us? His writings have dominated the thinking of most Christians and the Catholic and the Protestant branches for over 2,000 years. Now, throughout the history of the church, before and after Augustine, there were few, not many, just few Christian thinkers that would ever expose or advocate a positive position on human sexual desire. Now, you know what? The vast majority would speak of sexuality as dark, evil, and sinful. And you know what, folks? Even in our current modern contemporary day, many churches have difficulty articulating a balanced view of human sexuality. I mean, what is the church's sexual ethic? So last week on Saturday, I texted a handful of you and asked you a question. What is anger and what causes anger? And it was kind of fun to be able to share those responses to this church last week. And so today, I'm, I, I, yesterday, I was thinking, well, maybe I should text the same people and ask them the same question, but say, so what is lust and what causes lust? And then I thought, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. Oh, I thought about texting it. I even asked my husband if I should. And I'm sure you guys are all like, whoo! <laughs> Folks, the church's narrative is not this big old broadcast, but it comes through relative silence. The church's narrative kind of is, don't ask, don't tell, don't talk about sex. Of course, youth pastors occasionally address this subject, but with fear and trembling, with parental permission, with a measure of embarrassment, but it is rarely addressed from the pulpit or in adult Sunday school classes. And why is that? Why is that? 
it seems like the subject is taboo. And yet, the reality of this is the people that are home worshiping today, not only in this area and this community, but throughout the whole world, the people that are home in worship today, those who are attending worship, those who are sitting in the pews, they're also ones that are having affairs. There's also some that are still struggling with pornography. And there are some that are wrestling with lust, just like Augustine did. Just like you and I do, we all struggle with this. And so why is the church so silent? Why do we not help others? So by refusing to address sexuality, in my opinion, we apply that it is sinful. Our silence causes confusion, leads to ignorance, and further separates our souls from our bodies. And then when we hear in the news and in the media, oh my gosh, did you hear about clergy so-and-so and and pastor so-and-so or the priest so-and-so that they had sexual failings? And the congregation is like, oh my goodness, how could a holy person do such things? And we all wonder in anguish. But folks, our silent narrative leads to shame and denial about something that ought to be affirmed. Folks, if you don't know this, sexual desire is a gift from God the Father. Okay? The other false narrative that I'm going to jump over to, and we'll come back to both of these in review. The other false narrative, the second false narrative, comes from contemporary Western culture that says all sexual desire is good. Now, this narrative is not a product of the 20th or the 21st century. The sexual attitudes and behaviors of some of the Roman emperors and some of the Greek philosophers, I think, would make us blush today. Now, it may be more pervasive today in our society, But this narrative of all sexual desire is good, this false narrative that all sexual desire is good became accepted in American culture. What year would you say? In the 1960s, as young people advocated free love, free love. Do you remember Hugh Hefner? Hugh Hefner created the Playboy philosophy, which taught that sex is purely natural act, and that everyone ought to have as much as they want. And today we see it so clearly in the TV and the movies where the majority, think about this, where the majority of the sexual activity on our shows that we watch are extramarital affairs. And then the music videos. So one more warning. This is a one-minute video of not that many months ago of the NFL Super Bowl, you know, program. One minute. Here you go. The National Football League welcomes you to the Pepsi Super Bowl 54 halftime show. I figured you only needed to have a minute. That was just in January. Would you use the word provocative? Would you use the word sexual movements? Would you use the word sexy? 
We probably all would. And so the question is, does it still shock you or is that just our normal? And so Michael and I did a little research and we went back all the way back to the year 2000 for the Super Bowl um, shows. And you had like Phil Collins and you have Janet Jackson. You had the Rolling Stones in 2006. You had the Bruce Springsteen in 2009. There's a lot. Like, there, this has been going on for a while. But even when Phil Collins was doing the show, I mean, he was fully dressed He had probably the colored glasses. I mean, there is a little bit of a difference in those programs just within since since 20 years ago. And then somebody reminded me, well, what about Elvis? Remember how Elvis was offensive to people? Well, Elvis, you would be not even noticed anymore in this culture with your singing and with your dancing. This implicit narrative is that the good life is the lust-filled, sexually libertine life. That is what our culture kind of says. It seems in today's world that maybe, and you guys correct me, I'm always open for feedback, that the only restriction on sexual behavior today that we all would agree with, but it seems like the only restriction today that you must never harm or take advantage of another person. Right, that is true. And sexual activity must always be consensual. Yes, that is true. But beyond that, there's this dominant narrative underneath. If people want something, it is acceptable. And folks, this has opened our culture to practices that historically have been rejected. Things that formerly shocked us now barely register a response. Think of the TV shows you watched when you were your grandson's age or in high school or elementary school. Three's company was really considered wild, even though there was never any sexual images, but there was three people living together. Things that formerly shocked us now barely register a response. And I wonder, when I talk about, and I think about our kids and and your grandkids, what's not going to shock them in 20 years from now? Like, what shocks us today that will no longer shock us in 10 to 20 years from now? I had a a clergy friend in the valley tell me that there's a community where they're all married couples and they plan to swap wives. This is real. This is happening in our city. Two married couples. No one has taken advantage of the other person. The sex is consensual, so does that make it right? Does it make it good? I mean, if that is the only restriction that we as a society have on sexual desire, I mean, that shocks me, and I hope it always does. The things that formerly shocked us now barely register a response. What is that going to look like only 10 years from now? Because in an age of tolerance, we have simply become desensitized. Desensitized. And folks, you may be sitting there in your homes and you may be wondering, well, how did these narratives become so prevalent in our society and in our church? Let me tell you why. Because both contain a measure of truth as do all of the false narratives. Do you hear me? That's why they're so appealing. Both of these narratives are so prevalent because they contain a measure of truth. Yes, sexual desire does lead people to behaviors that they later regret. It is behind extramarital affairs, promiscuity, internet pornography, but it is wrong to blame the desire itself. We don't say the desire for food is evil because it leads some people to gluttony or to be overweight or that thirst is evil because it leads some people to drunkenness. Folks, sexual desire is not evil. Okay, so that's kind of the church's narrative. They just went to one extreme and said everything, sexual desire is all bad and sinful. And then the culture's narrative also contains parts of truth. Sexual desire is indeed good. 
God's first command to Adam and Eve was to be fruitful and multiply. And that concerned sexuality. It was designed by God. It is how we perpetuate the species, and it is a great enhancement to marriage. But simply because it is commanded by God does not mean that there are no boundaries. Simply because it is natural does not mean it is always right. Simply because it feels good does not mean it's always good. Not all sexual desires and expressions are good, and not all are bad. Okay, so those are the two false narratives that confuse us in in the church people and outside of the church people in our culture. So what does Jesus say? What is the kingdom narrative? What is Jesus' narrative? Folks, Jesus knows, doesn't he? Jesus knew how important sexuality is. He knew how it can destroy life and or enhance life. Jesus spoke to this issue in these verses in the Sermon on the Mount. And unfortunately, many times this, these verses are misunderstood, which contribute to our problem with sexuality. So in verse 27, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And so he's pointing back to the Torah, to the law, to the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. So all of those listeners would have understood what he was doing. You have heard that it was said that you shall not commit adultery. But then in verse 28, Jesus says, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his head. And then he goes on about the right eye causes you to sin, the right arm causes you to sin. It's better that it be just cut off and thrown away instead of going into hell for a whole body. And so this passage here, and you can read on it a little bit more, this passage has led many people to believe that Jesus is saying that simply looking at a woman lustfully is the same as committing adultery with her. And we probably could have a good debate on that. But it certainly does appear that way at first glance. But a closer look reveals something a little bit different, something a little bit deeper, a little bit more profound. You see, that word that is used for lust in this passage is epithemia. This word had a very specific meaning. You'll see it on the screen. This word, it does not refer to ordinary sexual attraction, but to intentionally objectify another person for one's own gratification. So can you say that word to you at yourself at home? Epithemia. I heard a youth pastor explain it this way to his students. He said, epithumia is not referring to the first look, but to the second look. The first look, the first look may be simple attraction, but that second look is leering. There is something different when you turn to look again. Lust does not value the person but mere body parts of a person. Epithemia goes beyond mere sexual attraction. It intentionally cultivates sexual desire for the sake of the feeling itself. It is the opposite of love. Our kids need to know that. Adults, we need to be reminded. It is the opposite of love. Love looks into the eyes and epithemia steals glances below them. Love values the other person as a person. Epithemia degrades the other. We must make a clear distinction between attraction and objectification, between feeling sexual desire and epithemia. How are you doing talking to your kids? How are you doing talking to your grandkids? Folks, when we fail to make this distinction, we adopt that first false narrative, and then we begin to think that sexual attraction is evil in itself. Folks, Jesus is teaching about a new kind of person. Jesus is teaching about the difference between inner and outer righteousness. And on becoming a new kind of person in the kingdom of God. Jesus is most concerned with your heart and my heart. With the heart of his church. Jesus is most concerned with the heart, particularly with developing a good heart. A good heart that is free 
free from objectification for the sake of self-gratification. Folks, in the kingdom of God, we are being transformed into a new kind of person based on our new identity as one indwelled by Jesus Christ. Such persons will develop an inner character that is not dominated by sexual desire. It doesn't always mean it's all gone, but it is not dominated. It is a key word here. Folks, in Jesus' day, Adultery was defined as sexual contact between two people, two persons, at least one of whom was married, but they weren't married to each other. The difference between our day and Jesus' day is that adultery was applied almost exclusively to women. A man, even a married man, it was so common, they could have sex with other women, including slaves and prostitutes. But a woman was allowed to have sex with her husband and her husband alone. The charge of adultery usually resulted in the execution of the accused woman. But here in Matthew's gospel, here in these specific verses in 27 through 30, Jesus is speaking directly to the men. Jesus explains to men that epithemia is a form of adultery. In adultery, sexual desire trumps over personal commitments. Adultery kind of implies, well, fulfilling my desire is more important than fulfilling my commitment. I don't really care if I hurt somebody else. Right now, all I can think about is me. It's so easy. We all can do that so easy. The same is true for lust. Valuing the other as a sacred being is tossed aside. And Jesus here in Scripture brilliantly gets to the heart of the matter. He invites invites us into the kingdom in order to become new people, people who value and respect others. All right, now some of you women, you may have just exhaled, whew, I'm so glad the pastor is not talking to me, but mostly focusing on the men. All right. And oh, and just so you guys know, this is not a sermon to be poking eyes at people or poking your elbows at people. This is a sermon for you and God and that you get to be open with your heart and your mind, okay? So women, epithemia happens to us too. Now, somebody told me, um, another woman, she says, well, I think this is strictly just a man problem. She goes, I don't objectify men's body parts. I don't look at men and cultivate lustful feelings, Pastor. That may or may not be true. None of this is true for all women. None of this is true for all men. However, women, we still wrestle with epithemia. It just gets expressed differently. Epithemia usually involves objectifying a body, true, but it can also involve objectifying a persona. Women may not struggle with objectifying male bodies, but they do struggle with objectifying a man's persona, his personality, his character. I mean, take for example, romance novels. Men, Do you buy romance novels? I don't see any hands up here. How about there? I mean, really, I wish I would have done the statistics just to check. But I would probably guarantee, and I'll come back and recorrect if I need to, I would say 90 plus percentage of people who purchase romance novels are women. Epithemia usually involves objectifying a body, but it can also involve objectifying a persona, and this is where we as women fall more into that struggling, their personality. Or what about chick flicks? Now, some guys will go to a chick flick with us, but why are they going with us? I mean, I mean think about that. I mean, romance novels and chick flicks, it's kind of like this. A lonely and misunderstood woman is rescued by a man named Dirk who whisks her away on his white horse. Think of Cinderella, and you've got 90% of all romance novel plots. The man leans over, and he whispers into her ear that she is the woman of his dream, that he will love her, that he will care for her and protect her forever. 
So women, women, we are fulfilling emotional needs to feel loved, to feel valued, to feel special, to feel sacred through other means like romance novels and perhaps chick flicks. And Dirk, oh, good old Dirk, he provides those feelings every time. But here's the problem. Dirk is not real. There lies the problem. He is a fantasy. He is an object worth a second, a third, and a fourth glance. I know of some ladies that have certain parts of their romance novels dog-eared, so when they have a bad day, they know exactly where to go for the juiciest parts to make them feel loved and special. So it's a fantasy. There is no object worth a second or a third or fourth look. There is no interaction. There's no intimacy. There's no relationship. There's no mutual enhancement. The reader is simply fantasizing because it feels good. Now, perhaps you are listening and you're thinking, well, okay, I I don't have that and I don't have that and I don't don't watch chick flicks. I don't read the romance novels. (laughs) I am good. I'm not done. Now, perhaps you're here in this group in this worship this morning And maybe you have thought about the perfect man. And maybe you have looked at some of your friends' spouses and said, oh, why can't you be more like him? He makes her breakfast every morning. Well, why can't you be more like her? She wears makeup every day and has lipstick on. I mean, we do that. And that can still be a form of epithemia. All right. Living in the kingdom, men and women, this is where we need to go. This is where we need to be. This is where we need to practice. Living in the kingdom is the cure for epithemia. Even though the expressions may vary between men and women, we share in the struggle, people. We share in the struggle. Do you hear me? We share in this struggle with epithemia. In the kingdom of God, we learn a new set of stories. As we live in the kingdom, we learn that God is good, We learn to see everything through God's eyes, living in the kingdom, and thereby changing our false narratives to the kingdom narratives, to what Jesus' narratives are, is the solution for overcoming epithemia. We all know too well that too many people, too many of us repeatedly try and fail to deal with lust on our own willpower through many tearful prayers and have found no genuine change. Folks, we cannot change our heart by changing outer behavior only. That's what Jesus is getting to. We cannot change our heart by changing our outer behavior only. Lust begins in the heart. The center of a person's identity and will It is not enough to maintain physical purity alone. One must guard against engaging mentally in the act of unfaithfulness. Jesus is not adding to the Old Testament law, but just correcting the interpreting of it. For even in the Ten Commandments, God had required purity of heart in Exodus 20. And this is why Jesus spoke about plucking out an eye when it offends. Jesus says, just cut it off. Jesus uses, and you guys know this, Jesus uses deliberate overstatements to emphasize the importance of maintaining exclusive devotion to one's spouse. He's trying to wake you up when he says things like, just cut it off. Jesus knows the problem is not our eye or our hand. The lust is in our heart. Now, to be sure, our body is involved in the act, but the real culprit is inward, in the imagination, in the heart. And if you were honest with yourself, you know this to be true. Those who have overcome epithemia have exposed it for what it is a false and short lived feeling of pleasure that ultimately harms life. We can begin to change only when we see it for what it is. Folks, the first part is understanding what this is. I know from firsthand experience different things. I'm like, God, help me with this. Help me not do that. Help me, help me, help me. I want to be, I have a pure heart. 
But so many times there is something different underneath that is deeper that you need to reflect on because secretly we want the lust. And so that's why this takes cultivating deeper work into that heart. We need to expose it. If you were living with secrets, that doesn't mean it's being exposed. And I don't mean you go out and embarrass yourself. I'm saying that there are opportunities where this church should be the church for all people who struggle with different things. Because those who have overcome this have exposed it for what it is, false and short-lived feeling of pleasure that ultimately harms life. And we begin to change only when we see it epithemia for what it is, and then we need to cultivate something else in its place, like a strong sense of worth. You are so valuable to God. He loves you more than you can even imagine. You are a child of God. To love and appreciate for life in the kingdom and healthy relationships that bring us that intimacy that we really are longing for. And then we find freedom, and freedom is an appropriate word here. Because if we struggle with this, I want you, we all struggle. If you are struggling with this, be encouraged. Countless people have overcome it. Begin by praying for that desire deep inside to change. God is God. Ask God to instill wisdom to see epithemia for what it is. And I know at church, you know, we're praying for Celebrate Recovery. They have all of these different brochures on different things to help with our hurts and our hang-ups and our habits. Freedom from anger, sexual addictions, codependency. Um, they even have some things on mental illness. And so, folks, I want this church to be a place where people can really come to the pastor or they can be in a small group and they can actually share what their real prayer is. Not a surface level prayer, even though we can do surface level prayers. But folks, if we're going to be people of the kingdom, if, people, if we're going to be the salt of the, of the soil of the world, the light on the hill, then we need to be called out and distinct, even in our sexuality. We need to help our children. We need to have these conversations. So in the prayer, I'm going to have you guys say it with me. The, the, this is the serenity prayer that after each Celebrate Recovery session, they always have a worship when everything is not COVID. Then they get into different small groups and they have a share. And then at the end, they talk about the prayer for serenity. So in your home, will you say it with me? The words are on your screen. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. The courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking, as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I, if I, if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your prayers while I uh, prepared that message. I just want to lift up. Um, last week, I forgot to collect for the love fund that we do at the end of each month. And at the same time, I know you guys are all faithful givers, and you probably went ahead and gave online through the love fund. And I'm grateful because I got a phone call this last week of a homeless couple, and um, he had a big, awful wound in his stomach, but he couldn't go to the hospital and a lot of, a lot of stuff. But because of the love fund, you all were able to pay for one night for him to stay in a hotel room. So I want to say thank you for all that you guys give. Thank you for those who have given above and beyond for the youth camp. And thank you for all they just give regularly for all the needs of the churches. Gracious God, through these gifts given freely, may the hungry be fed, the homeless receive shelter, the mistreated be set free. God, we offer all we have and all we are that your light might break forth in us and through us. Amen. Amen.
So the joys and the concerns of the group this morning, I'll start off. Um, we prayed for Carl Bell last week. He was going in for some tests, and I got the report that he had a lot of water retention, and he lost 15 pounds of water this week. I tried not to covet that ex- result, but we are grateful that the doctors are able to help him. So, Lord, in your mercy, you hear our prayers. And so we continue to pray for um, you know, Olga says, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen, sister. It's so true. We continue to pray for Ken Dotson, sister Janet, who's going through multiple cancer treatments. We continue to pray for the Sloan's family um, with different situations in their home. I also lift up Sally's grandma, um, who's going on hospice, Marge. And so continue to pray. She's also going to be moving And so just a lot of things. I pray for all of you teachers and the students. I also have joy with the pillbox ministry that Art's been able to do in all those pillboxes, so we're still collecting those. Michelle um, has prayers for Bobby as she's having surgery on her hand on Tuesday. So Heavenly Father, we lift up Bobby Roberts right here, right now. Lord, guide the doctor's hands and the surgeons. And Lord, we pray for a successful surgery and a full recovery. And we pray for Michelle and Maddie who will help Bobby in the healing. Lord, in your mercy, you hear our prayers. Great-grandson of the Murphys will soon be home with his mom. He is back east with his father and fighting with cancer. And his flight was canceled because of the hurricane. And so we lift up not only the Murphy's great-grandson, but we lift up the folks that things have changed with the, the hurricane and the different things that are going on in the world. Lord, in your mercy, you hear our prayers. Pe- pa- Peggy says with great sadness that she just found out that Don Kane has passed away just 45 days after his wife, Velma. So I know this church knows them. And Lord, be with us as we mourn this beautiful couple and be with the rest of their family, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, you hear our prayers. (laughs) Art says, thank you, Pastor, for the brave message. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You know, sometimes, just like when we are in service, we don't always lift all of our concerns up. We don't always want to type them out. But I want to remind each and every single one of you that God knows your heart. And like Ken and Sandy, like your anniversary is coming up, God knows your hearts. We continue to pray for your successful marriage, the ups and the downs of all of that because we've been there and we're grateful to celebrate this with you. I also know that Sue um, Sue Morley's birthday was this last week. I know Joel's birthday is coming up on the 18th. And if my memory serves me correctly, somebody I live with is having a 60th birthday on August 12th. So I'm just giving you advance notice. (laughs) I'm grateful for all of you that are signing in to worship. And I will lift us up in prayer. And then let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Heavenly Father, this is a big message today. And Lord, we have lifted up our praises. We've lifted up our grief. Lord, sometimes these, these prayers are a shock to us because we didn't know something. And Lord, we are so grateful that you go before each and every single one of us because Lord, we need your comfort. These are weird and just weird wilderness days, Lord. Help us to cling onto your cross and to your love, Lord, and help us to be that light on the hill. And so just like that day when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, Lord, We take this moment and repeat that prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I think we have one more song for you, and then I'll do the benediction. So stand or sit and worship with us this last song before we end our service today.
That's a goodie, isn't it? The old rugged cross. If you were all in worship this morning, because the topic is so sensitive and we all struggle in different ways, I would ask you to come forward for prayer. So please take this as an invitation to call me because sometimes things in the Holy Spirit, the way he works within us, we don't always know where to go and how to talk. So one, I just want to remind you that I'm here for you. It is never a bother when you want to call from a pastor. Actually, it's an honor when you allow me to be part of a struggle and a celebration. Another book, too, that is part of the Celebrate Recovery is called Life's Healing Choices, Freedom from the Hurts and the Habits and the Hang-Ups. And so part of our sermon series has been going through the 12 steps of the program in the secular world, but also the eight biblical principles. And so this is something that we don't have yet here, but this is another resource for all of you. Another shout out for the men's Bible study doing Colossians. And if you guys come by the church, you'll notice some of the bushes have been trimmed. And we'll put some pictures on our Facebook. We also had a couple of a a three-year-old and a seven-year-old that were also part of this group that helped. So thank you all for doing the different ways of serving for this church and for God in the world. So let's bow our head, brothers and sisters, for the benediction. Brothers and sisters, go forth and choose life. Walk on the ways of Jesus Christ and be strengthened by the Holy Spirit that the world might know the love and the peace of God. Go in peace. And all the people in the house and in their home said, Amen. I miss you all. Bless you in your day. I'll see you on next Sunday, if not earlier. Bye-bye.